sort of aware of, of these repeating visual images that I do over and over without meaning to. I, looking through my work recently, I was, I was putting together some pieces to send to an art show in Japan. And I just was going through my pages and I noticed that I always draw these scenes of, of lone people depicted from the back walking through these kind of grim urban landscapes. And I have that over and over in my work. And it, it's, my, my work, I think, has this real loneliness to it. I think there's this quality just in looking at the images of just always these sort of lone people. And, and I think that's a, that's, that's a real theme, although it's not, a, not an intentional theme. When I was in, uh, in like third grade, I was trying to draw comics and my teacher said, oh, this student I had a few years ago used to do his own comics and she gave me these. She actually lent me these and I stole them and I never gave them back. And it's some comics that this kid from my high school did, which to me are the coolest things in the world. It's just, it's like a, you know, an 11 year old kid's insane superhero fantasy or it's just, you know, he's read a thousand comics and he's trying to, to you know, somehow regurgitate this <laughs> into his own stuff. But it's very, it's very inspiring to me, though, that this kid, he wasn't that concerned with drawing or with getting the look of the comics right. He was just really concerned with telling a story. And as a kid, I was the exact opposite. I only just wanted to, to be able to draw. Like the, the comic artist, I had no real interest in, you know, finishing a story. Yeah, I was always convinced as a child that those perfect lines in, in uh, comic books were made by some kind of tool that I just didn't know about and that, that you know, my parents weren't telling me about. I used to always ask them, you know, buy me the kind of pen they use to draw comics. And, of course, they had no idea. And so I spent pretty much my entire adolescence up till the time I was... 14 or 15 trying to figure out what they used and then finally somebody told me they use a brush and I thought well that's not possible you can't get a perfect line like that using a brush but that that I had to face facts that is what they used so I spent the next you know 20 years trying to learn how to use a brush I buy these by the dozen they cost $20 a piece mm -hmm. and Probably four out of five I just throw away the day after I begin using it. They're usually no good, but this one I've had for eight months, and it's it's really good. They're made by a company Windsor & Newton in England. They're, they're uh, made of Kalinsky sable, a Russian sable. They're supposedly hand-potted by little old Russian ladies, which I'm sure is not true anymore, but they're, that's about the only brush I can use. I, can, I use these synthetic ones every once in a while just for uh, 
just to get the same line over and over. They're very sort of mechanical. They don't have a very interesting line. interested in all comics. I was interested in trying to find comics that have, that I, I feel are out there but I've never seen before. I always have this idea that there's some kind of comic that was made in Europe in like 1939 that's really cool that's going to be like my dream comic and, I, and yet, you know, I've never seen it or, or nobody's ever told me anything about it and I always feel like every time I go to some place like, you know, Holland or or uh, France or someplace like that, I'm going to be looking around and just find this one comic I've always been looking for, but it's just a fantasy. It's, they don't really exist. I think that's why I make my own comics, to make that comic I'm looking for. There's a, there's a Dutch comic I'll go over here <laughs> that I really love. It's good. Pinky Pinter. It's, it's like a, it's like a uh, Hergé imitation, but the printing on it is just so astoundingly weird. It's so psychedelic. I, I've wanted to make my comics look like this, but I couldn't even imagine how to get this kind of printing. And it's, there's something so crude about it. And yet, it's really sophisticated, too. This is the kind of comic I'm always looking for. It's like, who would choose these, these two colors together? I mean, it's like, but they're perfect, they somehow work, but it's, I would never think of them. And that's what I like about comics is that there's no sort of body of critical thought, so you're not, you know, you're not, like, if, if you're a conceptual artist, you really have to have read your theory, you know, you can't just go in there and sort of intuitively do, you know, a sculpture made out of bubble wrap without getting laughed off the, out of the museum, because you, you need to know what kind of various theories of the day you're kind of playing into, and, and things like comics and movies and things like that, they, you know, they have a body of of language of people talking about them, but they're not, it, that's not the only audience for it. You know, you can do it for, a, for an actual human being. To me, that's a much higher, higher uh, level of achievement than to appeal to a, an educated art audience, because I don't trust that audience as being a real audience. You know, I, I don't know. Whenever you have, a, have somebody in, the, in public kind of analyzing a situation and saying, you know, in vaguely Freudian terms, you know, like if, if you talk about some act of war as having sexual connotations or something like that, people just say, like, you're overanalyzing, you don't know what you're talking about, you're just crazy, and, you know, people are very threatened by that kind of thinking. My characters think too much, I think, <laughs> they're, you know, most... Most good protagonists are, tend to be people who sort of act first and, and don't ask any questions and just sort of bound into things. And, you know, people like Dickens always has characters that, that will just, you know, get involved in an adventure and get sort of caught up in something and they do things and it keeps the story moving. And my characters tend to sort of analyze everything and think about it and try to like avoid conflict and stuff. But I don't know, that's. I don't know how to write characters any other way than, than to have them think in some way the way I would think in any situation, and that's, that's my way of thinking usually, so. Let's see. 
This is one of my favorite unsung comics. It's came out in the 80s, and it's by a, a guy who's a, a hardcore Christian. And he, uh, actually have it signed by him, and he, uh, he did these comics that are just filled with insane unconscious sexuality. They're, they're like some of the crudest comics ever done, but they're, they're filled with all this weird sexual imagery. I've read these hundreds of times. They're like, look at this page, like the way this woman is posed and then this rocket. That's just great. That's great stuff. Like, look at this rock. <laughs> but I think it's totally unconscious. Or look at these creatures he created. They're just like these, you know. I found that happens kind of unintentionally in a lot of my comics. A lot of the characters slowly change into something different than I wanted them to be in the beginning. So they grow. They grow or, or recede, I don't know. They, they, they just change. It's, it's a weird thing and you can't really control it, you know, even if you try to, even if you're very aware of it. Still after you, you're finished and you read the whole thing, you see, no, he's, he's become what he is and I had no control over him. <laughs> It's hard. It's strange. Yeah. It's yeah, it is strange. I'm sure that doesn't happen with everybody. But they, they do take on a life of their own, and their, their physical qualities reflect that. If you look at the character in the first panel and then the last panel, it's almost a totally different person. You know, in that velvet glove story, the guy changes. Yeah, he changes. Really drastically, yeah. He started out... the style of drawing changes. Yeah, that was, I mean, I was, that was the most, uh, the most, you know, the period in which my work was changing the most drastically, and, and I was working very quickly, and I could, sometimes I, even from the beginning of a story to the end of a story, I could feel I was getting better or learning things, and so it was kind of frustrating when the whole thing was done. It's sort of... You know, I wanted to go back and redraw the first five episodes or something. Now, of course, I want to redraw the whole thing. But was it also, late, no. I mean, um, intellectually or storytelling-wise, sort of a coming out like? Yeah, I mean, it was. I had never done anything more than I don't know, 20 pages maybe in my life before that, and so it was. You know, to do something of that length and and where I was completely uncensored, I wasn't censoring any thoughts or ideas, anything I had that I thought was within the theme of the work, I would just throw in. I would just, you know, figure out a way to make it work in there. And that was a good way to work, although you can really paint yourself into a corner and you really get kind of stuck halfway through the story. And it was, then it became a real challenge. These are the 
kind of comics that I, this is another one from my childhood, and this is the kind of stuff I really loved, where this cover, you know, I was tried by an insect jury, so it's some guys somehow in a position where, where gigantic insects are, are deciding his fate, including a judge with a gavel. How could you not want to read this story? You know, it's like, but, you know, that's, that's the kind of stuff I've <laughs> been inspired by in my career. Guess what? What the, the general idea behind those comics is behind, behind that fantasy? Well, I know. The, I know the general idea behind things like that was that they would come up with a cover that was provocative, that would that would get somebody to buy a comic. I mean, I would have bought that comic, and then they just wrote any story they could think of that would comprise the image on the cover. Often, it's just somebody watching TV, and there's you know, oh, there's a movie about a guy being tried by an insect jury, and they figured, well, that's fair, put it on the cover, you know. But it, they were writing backwards, which was interesting. You know, they just come up with this very evocative image, especially to a, you know, an adolescent mind, and then just figure a way to, to make it work in the story. It didn't really matter. Let's just get through to the please. Marker. <coughs> and set, and action. I want to make love to him. I'm going to tell him you said that. So nice to see you again, baby. Hi, Weird Al. My friend here has... Shut up! Room. She says she wants... Shut up! Oh, my God. God, that is obviously him. Ghost World, the underground comic book comes to life. We have to get together this summer. Yeah, that'll definitely happen. I have, I have the whole story sort of ruminating inside my head for months and months, even years sometimes, and, and then when I get to a certain point where I, I kind of know too much about the story, then I start to just write everything down. I just sit down one day and write down every single thing I can think about the story, you know, just little details, the clothes they would wear, you know, things like that. And, um, and then from that, I just sort of see what turns into a story. I just take all those elements and kind of put them together in a way that, that kind of leads to a story, and then it, then it kind of takes on a life of its own at that point. Here's like the kind of thing I would do, just basically sit down and just write down every scene, and then, and then doodle it out like this, just the most basic doodle. I try to do it as fast as I possibly could so there's no time wasted at all. You hate to do the drawing. Section. No, I love, yeah, I hate. I just I hate for it to not be spontaneous. You know, it's. I want it to. I don't want to feel like I've already drawn something four times because it it can get really dull. try to think in terms of of the rhythm of a page I mean I know you know the story sort of coming to an end so you know we see it's like you know that the, they're getting to be more and more panels per page and you know you see something like this is sort of a pause where where there's only two panels and they're sort of very still and and then you know but then things are sort of accelerating in the story and here it's kind of you know this is the last kind of slow point and then it's building up and then we get to this and it's really, things are really moving towards a big finale, so I felt like I had to have a real kind of steady rhythm where the panels are all basically the same. And there are the, these are the, uh, in this story, the most panels I did per page were nine, so these are as many panels as I would have per page. So um, that kind of implies a kind of a staccato rhythm. And mm -hmm. the interesting parts of telling a story in a comic are the, the transitions between the panels, you know, it's how do you get from here to here and what does that mean and 
And this is the kind of thing where I was really playing around with sound, where you, you, you know, you hear this kind of audience sound throughout the whole scene, even when it's not in the background, you're sort of aware of this audience, and mm -hmm. you hear this these kind of laughs. I wanted them to be heard as though they're just sort of echoing in the character's head, almost like he's out of his mind. You know, these these scenes, these characters almost don't look like real people in the audience. They're just like haunted images in his unconscious. You don't even really know if this is happening or not. No, I don't believe in I don't believe in solutions for my characters unless it comes organically, but they come to sort of recognize themselves to some degree, but they don't there's never quite a happy resolution. They never but you know, who's happy? I don't know anybody who's fully happy or who has nothing but optimism. I mean, that just seems an arbitrary point to end a story, you know. So we all have moments where where we feel like the the future is great and everything's going to be great and those last for 20 minutes and it seems unfair to end a story right at that point. And these are, this is a comic from my childhood. These are the kind of things that I had laying around the house where, you know, it's super boy. But the great thing about these old superhero comics is that they weren't about, you know, uh, fighting people from other planets or, or you know, major uh, complicated science fiction war stories and things, but it was just stuff like Clark Kent gets his first haircut, you know, and it's, that's the kind of thing that was interesting to me as a kid was like, yeah, if you had indestructible hair, how could you get a haircut? Yeah. Stuff that I could actually sort of relate to. The history of comics is really the history of American comics, although in you know places like Japan and Europe they had their own world of comics. But to me, comics just, they, they symbolize America somehow. You just, when I see an old comics section, I just, I think of, of all the, the things that we associate with the goodness of America. You know, it seems like one of those few good things that we've created and also a thing. Authentic. It's authentically American, and it's it's a very sort of a homegrown kind of small-time culture that's not not been um, sort of infected by by any corporate concerns. Although you know that's my my view of my world of comics that I'm thinking of. Whereas most people think of the stuff that's in the newspaper every day, which is just of no interest to me at all. And those, you know that's that's what's left of of the, you know, what was once the most amazing thing in the world, which was the, the Sunday comics page where they give great artists like Windsor McKay and Lionel Feininger. They said, you know, here's a full page in color every week to do whatever you want. And they're doing the most astounding graphic work of the, of the 20th century. And, and now it's been distilled into, you know, three tiny panels of a guy talking to a cat or whatever. I'm certainly attracted to these images from my youth or from before my youth. There's a certain mystery to anything before you were born, I think, or from the early years of your childhood that I, I think I'm always trying to recapture the feeling of that mystery. And something about, about the images in comics, and in old comics especially, where it's this very kind of stark iconography. They're using, um, you know, sort of symbols, you know, it's, characters have to read instantly as being what they are you know you see a, a drawing of little orphan Annie or something and you know immediately she's an innocent little girl and you know lost in this world and there's something very strong about that that I, it has a timeless quality I mean you can always look at old comics and have some sense of what they're about and of what they're trying to communicate with these characters and just the way they're positioned with each other and I, I always try to keep that in mind that kind of stark clarity of comics but then when you grow older and you start having nightmares and these innocent looking characters become 
start playing a part in your nightmares, then then the horror starts. And then That's where it gets interesting. Yeah. That's when you when you can take those icons, those characters, and turn them into something else, or let them let them turn into something else on their own. I guess is the key. You know, I, I thought I had made it up. I just was do doodling one day, and and that drawing just really hit me. There was something about the the nose is slightly higher than the than the eyes, and it, there's something really strong about that. And then I was at my mom's about five years later, and I was going through the attic, and I found this box, this old box I had for some toy as a kid, and it had that exact drawing on the box without the hat, but just this exact same face. And I realized that that box had been in my room as a kid, and I just stared at it when I was lying in bed. And it just sunk into my unconscious and somehow sprang forth again. And then, since then, people have sent me stuff from all over the world that's very similar to that. It's just like somebody transmitting some kind of information through some very banal artifact like that is very interesting to me. Do you think there's a relation between nostalgia and paranoia? <laughs> I think I think there is, just because all the most nostalgic people I know are also the most paranoid. So there, there's clearly some kind of chemical relation in the brain or something. It's funny because when I did that David Boring story, you know, it has this whole thread of these kind of undefined terrorist attacks running through the background and he doesn't really he's not really a political person so he's not really focused on what they are and sort of just trying to ignore the whole thing but they keep sort of encroaching on his life and affecting him and I did that thing it really feeling that way it was sort of towards the end of um, 1999 and I really you know there were all these rumors that on New Year's Eve 2000 the world was going to blow up and terrorists were going to bomb you know the, the Empire State Building or wherever they have the the parade and or the uh, you know the uh, ball dropping thing in New York, I guess in Times Square, you know, and they thought you know there'd be all kinds of events, and so I, I really was starting to feel like the world is going to go out of control, and by New Year's Eve it's going to be you know just devastation and and chaos and mayhem everywhere. And what a bummer! And it was not you know I was actually kind of disappointed when the night came and went and nothing really happened. You know I was sort of all set for you know I had my bottles of water and you know canned foods all. Prepared prepared for when the, you know, there was looting and gunplay in the streets, but it never happened. But then it just, it, it just took a year and a half later for it to, to finally happen. And now I feel like the things that are happening now are exactly the kind of things that I was imagining were going to happen when I did that story. So I was right. I wasn't paranoid at all.